welcome. Hello to you all in the building. Hello to you um, watching online, especially if it's uh, my dad. Happy Father's Day. Sorry I didn't get your card yet. Um, <laughs> don't laugh. <laughs> I'm being vulnerable. I'm raw. Um, yeah, I hope you're uh, excited today. Um, I, I don't know the whale score. Do we, do we want to know? Don't tell me if it's good or bad. I hope you're enjoying the Euros. Um, I've, no, no, we don't need to mention that then. Uh, today we're talking about hospitality from the home. If you're new to us uh, and this is your first time, we're in the middle of a series on hospitality, welcoming the stranger, what it is to love uh, well. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, sermons, Hospitality of Heaven, Tim did a couple of weeks ago, Hospitality of the Heart, uh, to, uh, Halls was speaking. Um, and today we're talking about hospitality from the home. Uh, which I'm excited about. But before, before we get stuck into that, I would love for you to turn around to someone it's safe to turn to, or if you're on your own and you can't, then just have a little think about the greatest animated film of all time. Have a little, have a little debate. You've got 60 seconds to figure that one out. very heated over here. It's getting very heated over here. 10 seconds. 10 seconds to figure it out. Let's get the right answer. Five, four, three, two, one. No idea. Well, I wish I could get you to shout out some of the answers. Could someone just mime what they think the greatest... Uh, <laughs> no, don't worry. Um, if you are watching this online and you've just got really excited about it, why don't you pause me and head over to some uh, on-demand, uh, watch that for a bit, and then you can come back to it. <laughs> Unfortunately for us, we've got to get through the next two hours and 15 minutes of this sermon. Um, if you're new uh, and that sounds too much, don't worry, it should be 20 minutes. Um, did you guys figure it out over there? You were having a bit of an argument. The youth, hello to some of the older youth over there. No? No, they didn't figure it. W one of the answers I would have found acceptable would have been despicable me. Did anyone have that? In that, no, wowzers. Despicable me, I happened to be um, on the sofa doing some last minute sermon prep this afternoon while my kids were distracted by Despicable Me. If you don't know the story, it's brilliant. There's this um, bad guy uh, who ends up uh, taking some orphan kids into his house for his own purposes. It's like the, the, the wrong version of hospitality. He's like, hang on a minute, I could use these kids to get um, a shrink ray so he can take on the moon, invites these kids into his home. There's all sorts of funny things. One bit that I hadn't noticed until today was when he goes to get a loan from the Bank of Evil and just above the Bank of Evil's door it says formerly the Lehman Brothers and I was like, <laughs> it's just so cheeky and appropriate. Loved it. It's just amazing. Um, so uh, uh, I, I want to ask you this question. Is your home a private place for your purposes or a platform for God's? It is hard to answer, isn't it? Yes. Is it a private place for your purposes or is it a platform for God's? Now, I'm not suggesting that there isn't some appropriateness in having some boundaries and having some space. I'm an introvert. I love my me time. Um, but I wonder what you consider your home and of the many people in this room and watching online will have different experiences of home. Maybe you share a home. Maybe you have a home to yourself. Maybe it's a flat. Maybe it's a tent. Maybe it's a car. Whatever it is, a space where you have your space, your place. And is it entirely for your private purposes or is it available for God as a platform? And Despicable Me, we end up seeing at the end of this story, spoiler alert, um, that Gru, this bad guy, has turned from inviting people into his home for his purposes to actually 
nurturing family in his own home. And it's beautiful, and it's funny, and it works. Um, Something else that's beautiful and funny is the Bible, and we're going to focus a little bit on that as well. So you can head to Hebrews. We're going to read a little bit from Hebrews 13. Thankfully, because Tim and Holly have done such good jobs over the last two weeks of hitting hospitality, what it means to be welcomed by a father, what it uh, means to be served by Jesus, all aspects of that. If you haven't seen those talks, catch up on them. But um, I'm just going to do some quick, um, hopefully quite practical um, specifics around hospitality. But we're going to look at this verse to kick us off from Hebrews 13 and reading 1 and 2. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, people have entertained angels without knowing it. That's our first passage done. That's the focus of of what we're going to be uh, just considering this evening. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers. It sounds pretty straightforward. Just putting this... uh, This letter of Hebrews in context, it might have originally been a sermon used as a letter perhaps, uh, and it was written to the Hebrew people. It was written to the Jews, the Jewish Christians, um, probably at a time when there was some quite intense persecution going on, either from the Romans or from uh, traditional Jews who hadn't really got this concept of Jesus and were um, a little bit offended by these new people with their new way of doing things. So there's a bunch of people who are speaking into Christians facing assault on their togetherness, on on what it means to be them, um, is what's happening here. And so at the end of this long, chunky Bible message, this Hebrews, we come to some just really specific, practical things. And it's saying, don't forget, Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to entertain strangers. And then a little allusion to Abraham, who actually had been hospitable with his home way back when it was a tent. Uh, And actually, it turned out he was hosting some angels. Um, So there's an allusion there that most of the readers of Hebrews would have immediately got the connection to in that little passage. There's a question here around what it means. Who are we referring to when it comes to brothers and sisters? Often, actually, this is around Christian brothers, other people who have faith. We sometimes think this is an evangelistic thing. This is actually an expression of the wider family. Back in the day, there wouldn't have been the Holiday Inn to book into if you were traveling, if you were on route somewhere, or if you found yourself in a different place. And so people would, rel- some of the places where you would stay overnight actually would be known for all the wrong things if you were uh, of any religious pers- persuasion. So you wouldn't want to stay there. And so actually, God's family, the people of the Jews would rely on each other to host and to have their homes open, a safe place where they could be, have refuge, have some haven of comfort and know that they were going to be welcomed and looked after and it wasn't going to be risque. So that's something of the context of, of the time that we're, that we're looking at, something of this place and space. So in, in a sense, uh, we don't need to open our homes to each other when we're traveling around. It might be that you're hosting some people who are up for a conference and you open your home and they've got a place that's safe, they don't have to go somewhere else. There's some direct correlation if we're looking at it, but actually we might want to consider differently what it means to host the stranger, uh, someone who is unfamiliar. And one of the ways that you will know if someone is, has the potential to be an angel is that you won't know their mum's name. So that's how I'm just going to frame the people that you might think of as strangers. So you might know that they come to church and they've got a faith, but I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of people in this room, and I know you, no offense, but you are not angels. I've I've got it figured out. I I know, I know your family, I know where you come from. I'm pretty sure it's Guernsey and not heaven, for example. Do you know what I mean? There's there's certain places, like, I love you and all that, but you're not an angel. Uh, and so we're just 
framing the kind of people that we might be wanting to, might be being encouraged in this passage to welcome. It might be Christians who you don't yet know well, that you open your home to. Maybe you start a life group, maybe you just have some drinks around at your flat, maybe whatever it is, but it's people that you don't necessarily know the names of. I would hope that if you're here for the first time tonight, that you find a welcome, that you find this to be a hospitable place. But we're talking today about being using our homes for hospitality, to welcome those who are different from us, welcome those who we don't yet know. And it's also an encouragement to be loving our brothers and sisters, the people that we do know, the people that we hang out with. So I'm going to hit three points that I just want to uh, look at specifically in terms of getting into some practical things. And the first one is homeless and hospitable. Homeless and hospitable. You might be sat here thinking, I haven't got a really nice place to welcome people back. Or if I was going to invite people back, I'd have to ask my parents. And they're pretty quirky anyway, so I don't really want to go there. Uh, you, 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 you might have some complicated arrangements in the place that you call your home. And might then discount yourself from entertaining the stranger or having someone in your spaces. Well, there's still a heart behind it. Holly was talking about the heart behind our hospitality. There's still a place in your heart that, it has, that wants to welcome. I was talking with a friend of mine at the moment who uh, doesn't have a fixed abode, doesn't have a home, uh, loves God, and is still practicing hospitality. And so this week invited someone who had great physical need and emotional, spiritual need to share a bench with him. We can still practice hospitality without having a home. That's what one extreme, but you might have some space, some place. So I ask you that question again. Is that space in that place, is it a platform for God's work? Or is it just your private space, that place that you get to define how it runs, who's allowed there, and all of those things? Has God got access to your home so that he can, you can practice hospitality? Jesus, the one who modeled hospitality for us as fully human and fully God, didn't have a fixed place. We'll look at that verse in a little bit, but he didn't have a fixed place to call his home. He was more often hosted than hosting. And so we can be encouraged if that's you and your home space is not straightforward, that there's still a place and an opportunity to be hospitable. The second one, and we're just going to we'll spend a bit more time on this one, is hospitality without hunger. I want to encourage you, please don't practice hospitality on an empty stomach. Don't be hungry and hospi hospi hospitable at the same time. And what I mean by that is make sure that you are fed well yourself in your own heart before you try and open your home. Don't do hospitality on an empty stomach in terms of your relationship with God or in terms of the way that you approach welcoming people into your home. What we're not talking about is a kind of entertaining, let's get all the right stuff out, let's get the best Doritos and even maybe some dip. We're not talking about all the finest wines that you might want. and We're not talking about entertaining, we're talking about a home that is open. And the danger is that we get all of our home bits right, the physicality right, and we don't actually pray. We don't spend time going, God, this, whoever you're going to send my way today, I pray you bless them. Maybe you know that some people are coming around at a particular time. Karis and I are just in a habit of going, okay, well, we've roughly got the house somewhere where it should be. And there's enough people in this room to know that's not always the case. Um, but we're still going to be open Homed, we're still going to invite people in, but we want to make sure that we are praying about what God wants to use our home for. God, what is your purpose for tonight? What's your plan? We want to just ask if you've got any specific things to say. We'll just generically love people. But what would it look like for you if before you had people come around, you spent 60 seconds, five minutes just praying? They might be coming around to watch the football, but you could still pray. They might be coming around just for five minutes and a drink. Well, you could still pray. 
because suddenly that's the opportunity for your private space to become a platform for God to use. It's really basic, it's really straightforward, but you, you just might not be in a habit of it, of praying before you welcome people into your home. And if, and if it's literally just, I'm going to pretend that I'm not quite at the door yet, while I just say, Lord, help me, to start with, fine, but just pray. Invite God into the moments where there are other people in your space. Straightforward? Straightforward. Here's why it's important, and we're going to look at um, Matthew 14 for a little example from Jesus. Matthew 14. This is when um, Jesus is uh, in a pretty... He's had some stuff go on. His cousin has just been beheaded. I don't know if ever anyone's gone through that themselves, but it's not, I'm, I'm sure it's not a positive experience. He's, this is, there would have been a real, that would have represented a drain on his heart. And we pick up at verse 13 of chapter 14 in Matthew. When Jesus heard what had happened to John the Baptist, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. He, know, he, he knows he needs to steward his heart. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You can give them something to eat. This passage is another reminder that we want to be expecting God to be working supernaturally when we're hospitable, when we're hosting. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Thank God for the little you have when it comes to hospitality. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. And there's, there's a little passage break and then a, little, a new little title heading, but we could miss the continuity of the story here. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Jesus knows he needs to steward his heart in order to be hospitable, in order to welcome people, in order to minister heaven, in order that his space and place can still be a platform for God. He's got some stuff going on in his life, and maybe you've got some stuff going on in your life. That could easily be an excuse to keep your private space private. But it doesn't need to be the case. You can feed on God, snack on him, feast on him. Make sure that you are removing yourself enough weekly, daily, so that you aren't hungry when it comes to people passing your way and opportunities to be a platform for heaven. Does that make sense? This is an example of Jesus going, okay, well, I've ended up hosting. I wasn't planning on everyone following me around the lake. So here I am with a whole bunch of people in front of me and I still haven't processed what's gone on. I'm going to get rid of people when they've had a meal and I've done the hosting, but I know I need to catch up with my own heart. If we don't steward our own hearts, we're going to find hospitality extremely exhausting. And you might be put off hospitality because of situations where you have tried to do it without being in the presence of God and without taking yourself away to be in a lonely place. So, you can be homeless and hospitable. Don't do hospitality hungry. And then the final one I just want to look at is hospitality as haven. Haven being that safe place. Now, I don't know if it's normal that we have um, World Refugee Day on the same day that we celebrate Father's Day. I don't know if that happens every year. But either way, I love the connection of it. There is a Father in Heaven whose heart is perhaps breaking for what was in 2018 80 million refugees worldwide. Roughly half of those, 18 and under. 
I think I think I've got the stats right that I checked. Seventy point eight million, sorry, people around the world. Among them are nearly thirty million refugees. Sorry, over half of those who are age eighteen, under the age of eighteen. It's World Refugee Day and we're considering, I, I, I don't want to brush over the fact that there are so many people who don't have homes because of violence and because of persecution. They have had to flee their private place or their platform. And they are without home and they're moving around. What would it look like if your private space became a platform, became a haven, became a place where someone could come and take refuge? going to read from Matthew 25, our final passage just on this. Uh, it's this, this parable of the sheep and the goats. This is Jesus speaking. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, verse 31, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison. You came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When, when did we see a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. If you've been a Christian alive for a while, you will know this passage. Maybe you'll know that particular verse. Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. I would just love you to consider what it looks like for your home the place where you get some say in who comes and goes to consider what it would look like for God to use that space and place as a platform for people who are broken and hurting, who are without hope or clothes or whatever it is. We're blessed in this church that we have our Transform Ministries, we have a collective contribution to the broken and the needy in our society. But that could be less of a blessing if it robs us of doing that in our ho own homes. If we don't strive to welcome the stranger into our spaces and places as well. I wonder whether you've considered fostering or adoption. Maybe you wouldn't be able to do that at this stage in your life, but maybe God wants to put that on your heart right now. What I can't think of a more powerful way to transform a life and to do hospitality, to use your home as a platform for God, than to invite a child into your home and to family them, to adopt them, maybe. But maybe you also want to consider those who are being persecuted, your brothers and sisters who uh, perhaps don't live down the road from you, like when this passage was originally written, but are persecuted for their faith. You might want to sign up to an Open Doors email letter or newsletter or just be praying. I don't know what it would look like, but I would love us to feel a little bit more uncomfortable about the stuff that we don't see day in, day out, that perhaps God wants to put on our hearts. So... Let us not give up on loving each other while of using our homes to entertain strangers. 
We can be hospitable even if we're homeless. Don't do it hungry. Keep feeding on God in doing that. But also I wonder if God might want to create a haven using your home as a platform for God's presence in powerful ways. Oh man.